I am Nisha Powell Twadiri Mukiza. Uh, pronouns are they and she. And today I'm presenting on grassroots organizing strategies for healing our black, trans, non-binary, and queer bodies. Um, this is a presentation by a black, queer, non-binary woman, myself. Um, and it's really for black LGBTQ folks in the room. It's my love letter to y'all. And, but this is also a call to action to folks who are not black LGBTQ people to really learn about the work, uh, the organizing, the healing work that black, queer, and trans folks are engaged in, um, and to figure out how um, you want to support us, how are you gonna funnel resources to us, how are you gonna make sure that we have what we need um, to implement these organizing strategies. So, um, disclaimer, I am a Gemini. So, <laughs> um, we are so notorious. Um, my mind runs a lot, I'm all over the place. So I really just wanted to get grounded in this moment. Um, this moment that will never get back. I just really want us to do just a quick breathing exercise um, just to root ourselves in this moment. So if you'll indulge me um, by just breathing in for three counts, holding it for three counts, breathing out for three counts and, and holding it and really just think about whatever grounds you, what's your purpose for being here today, um, anything that, that you wanna think about. So if we can go ahead and breathe in. Breathe out. All right, I feel good, y'all. All right, so why am I here today? Because I want to explore how we can organize towards our healing. So about a decade ago is when I learned about grassroots organizing. Um, and how I define grassroots organizing in this presentation as, is when people get together to make strategic change in the face of social injustices that personally impact them. But I understand that there can be many definitions of grassroots organizing, right? And not any one of them is more valid than the other. Um, also, I wanna say that in this presentation, I'll kind of um, interchangeably use black, queer, and trans folks and black LGBTQ folks. Um, but I understand that there are there can be nuances between the two that we could sit here and discuss all day. But um, in this presentation, I'll use them kind of interchangeably. Um, so about a decade ago, um, I was just a small girl from a small rural town in, in Brunswick, Georgia. I, I went off to college, um, a majority white college, but ironically, that's where I started to learn about, um, I learned how to name the oppression that I was facing in my personal life, the oppression I saw in my communities. That's where I learned about black queer feminism. That's where I learned about womanism. That's where I learned about grassroots organizing. Um, and I'm really grateful for those experiences. So that's, that's kind of where I, I learned. I learned and I started identifying as a black queer feminist. Um, and I started organizing. I started organizing so I could be able to build institutions and systems that work for people like me because I realized that the institutions and systems that we have now, they're not working for people like me. I wanna talk about organizing as a mode of healing. I wanna say that um, in a social justice movement for the past decade, I've seen a lot of personal and intergenerational trauma hinder our movements and also tear our movements apart. I've seen black, queer, trans, and non-binary folks who are so often leading justice movements being pushed out of organizing spaces because our needs aren't being centered, because our labor isn't being compensated, and we're not actually seeing material improvements in our lives. I found that we spend so much of our time organizing on the defensive 
We spend so much time making sure that families don't get broken apart. We spend time making sure that we don't get a conservative Supreme Court justice, right? We're always just fighting, fighting, fighting on the defensive and not seeing improvements in our own lives. So that got me thinking, instead of always organizing towards stopping these harmful policies and politicians, what if we organize towards our own healing? What if we organize to facilitate our own healing um, and to create our own solutions? So I wanna talk about why healing is so uh, important to me um, and to other black, queer, and trans folks. Um, for me, I feel like I've been in pain in some in one way or another most of my life, whether that be emotional, physical, mental, spiritual, dealing with so many different chronic health issues, hypertension, endometriosis, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder from child sexual abuse. I mean, I know that some of these health issues have been genetic, but I also know that they've been exacerbated and they've been caused by systemic oppression because of white supremacy, because I lacked the things I needed to take care of myself, whether that be health insurance or just a lack of having community support, uh, if it was having a lack of money, or just having to deal with microaggressions and blatant racism, queerphobia, transphobia in my everyday life, that takes a toll on your body. My story is not unique. There are plenty of other black LGBTQ folks who are going uh, through the same thing, who are dealing with chronic health issues. A lot of us have seen a statistic about black women, black trans women having an average lifespan of 35 years. I've often quoted it myself, but it's become kind of a controversial statistic because think about who were the researchers who, who found that statistic? What did they look like? Right? What methods did they use? And also that statistic does not take into account uh, the resiliency of black trans women. It doesn't take into account the self-determination of black trans women. It, it really takes away um, the agency of black trans women, right? Um, when you look up black LGBTQ health statistics, what you're gonna find is gonna be biased it, there's not gonna be a lot of it, and a lot of it, it just sounds really scary and dreary. Like, but sadly, you know, it's true. There are lar large amounts of us who are, you know, dying early, whether it be from illness or if it be from being killed or, and we're living, you know, unsafe, unhealthy lives, right? So those statistics, you know, I take them with a grain of salt. Once again, thinking about who, who's doing this research and also taking into account that they're not considering white supremacy, they're not um, taking into account systemic oppression that causes all of these poor health outcomes. So I'm about to get into the organizing strategies for healing. Um, I wanna say that I've been engaged in them. If I haven't engaged in, in them personally, I've, I've written about them, or I'm in community with people who are doing this work. Um, but I do wanna caution that not one strategy is, fits all, right? Um, I've heard a few people today say, you know, a certain group is not a monolith, so just like any other group, black LGBTQ folks aren't a monolith. We don't all organize in the same way. We all don't want to organize in the same way. We all can't organize in the same way. I want to acknowledge that in our ableist society, a lot of folks are hindered from even participating in movement work, in organizing, and it's the job of everyone in this room to make sure that that's not how our movements are working. <coughs> And once again, I just wanna say for aspiring allies and accomplices to black, queer, and trans folks in this room to really learn about these strategies and think about how um, you can uh, contribute resources. So I wanna talk about reproductive justice, which Imani earlier this morning so beautifully spoke about. Reproductive justice. It's a movement started by black women and it goes beyond reproductive rights. It, it's when, 
it's when, <laughs> sorry, um, it's when we have the control over our own bodies, we have aut autonomy over our own bodies, we have the right um, to have birth, we have the right not to, we have the right to give birth, or we have the right not to give birth, right? We have the right to raise our children and, and healthy, safe neighborhoods. We have the right to live in safe and healthy neighborhoods ourselves. Um, and so that's why reproductive justice moves past reproductive rights. So here are some of the strategies that black queer insurance folks are engaged in around reproductive justice, accessing our right to have children. Um, so much of the pro-choice movement, which leaves out people of color anyway, so much of it's around uh, preserving our right to abortion, which is super important, but what about our right to have children? Black, queer, and trans folks, we want to become parents too. Um, if I have a uterus and my partner has a uterus, obviously we're gonna need help if we wanna have a natural childbirth. And how can we access the technologies um, for affordably or for free to start families? So that's a right, a right to have children. And also uh, there are states and municipalities that are trying to stop LGBTQ folks from being able to even adopt or foster children. And that's a reproductive justice issue. That shouldn't be the case. A loving family should not um, be prohibited from doing that just because they're LGBTQ. Uh, I think earlier today, Imani spoke about um, the, materni the maternity mortality rate for black mothers in the United States. So in our country, black women are dying, or black pregnant people in general are dying in childbirth or after childbirth in higher rates than countries that are much wealthier than ours, that spend much less uh, on their healthcare system. So that speaks to how oppressive our, our healthcare system is. It's rooted in oppression and white supremacy and we're not, it's not safe for us to even give birth. That's why accessing queer non queer non-binary and trans birth workers of color is so important. Midwives and doulas who can advocate and support us during these processes and help us navigate this white supremacist healthcare system. I want to talk about revolutionary mothering and parenting. I hope some of you in this room have heard of the book um, Revolutionary Mothering. Um, it's an anthology put together by Alexis Pauline Gums. Um, China Martins and Maya Williams. And it's about the radical act of mothering and parenting and how it's one of the most radical things you could do, right? It, it even goes beyond just uh, parenting your biological children or adopted children, but also just your mothering and parenting in community, the ways that we self selflessly give in community and we don't expect anything in return, that's mothering, right? And that's parenting. Um, talking, of, talking about revolutionary parenting, that also means um, very intentionally raising your children with an understanding of social justice, of race, of gender, of class, of uh, bodily autonomy, and of consent. Raising children with all of that, those understandings. Also, black, queer, and trans folks are working to preserve the rights of undocumented, queer, non-binary, and trans parents of color. Um, in so many times, uh, black folks get left out of the undocumented conversations, and so we have to remember that there are undocumented black folks. Some of them are queer and trans, and having all of those uh, historically oppressed identities interact with each other, these folks need support, and we need to be able to keep these families together. So this is a collective I helped found um, in Seattle, Washington called the Queer and Trans Pan-African Exchange. Um, we are a group of black folks from across the African diaspora who just work to build connection within our community and with, folk, with black, queer, and trans folks all over the globe. Um, in Washington state, um, there were bills that were prohibiting um, trans and gender non-conforming folks from using a restroom that matches um, our gender identity. I know Washington state is not the only state that faced that. That happened in many states and it's probably still happening. 
And so that's where the let my people pee comes from. Um, from that legislation, we were inspired to shoot a mini, mini documentary featuring trans and gender non-conforming people of color talking about their experiences, not only with um, when it comes to using bathrooms, but also when trying to seek abortions or reproductive health care. Um, and that's a mini documentary that will be coming out towards the end of the year. So keep an eye out. I want to just give shout outs. Um, there are definitely more reproductive justice orgs that are doing the work, but here are just a few. Queer and Trans People of Color Birth Work Project based in Seattle, Roots of Labor Birth Collective um, based in the Bay, a collective of doulas and midwives of color, and Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective, which is based in, in Atlanta. Next, I wanna talk about organizing around decolonizing health as healing. I wanna talk about ancestral medicine. There's many black, queer, and trans folks who are turning to our ancestors to find out more about the food they ate and the herbs they used and the medicines they used and reclaiming that for ourselves because that medicine is just as valid as Western medicine is. And it's so important for us to um, remember what our ancestors were doing. Um, and it worked for them for thousands of years, so why can't we rec reclaim that? I wanna talk about pushing for culturally relevant healthcare. So not only is like racism ingrained in our healthcare system, but so is queerphobia and transphobia. So we need to move past uh, you know, having a healthcare system that's just culturally competent. We want culturally relevant healthcare um, that acknowledges um, not only that people of color and black people in particular are humans and we feel as much pain as everybody else, um, but we want them to understand gender pronouns and we want them to understand that trans people can get pregnant and do get pregnant and want to get pregnant. So we need culturally relevant health care. Single payer health care, um, also known as Medicare for all. So this is an interesting one because obviously you have to engage um, with the state or government if we're ever gonna have single payer health care, um, which is also universal health care, meaning we would all have free health care. Um, but this is a way, this would be a pathway to all of us having health care, which is uh, such an issue in black, queer, and trans communities. How many times are we gonna see people crowdfunding just to take care of their health? If we had single payer health care, that would change that. The only reason we don't have single payer health care is in the mid century, 1950s, when they were coming out with all these public benefit, uh, public benefit programs, uh, white folks did not want people of color to have these benefits. They didn't want Medicare for all, and that's why we don't have Medicare for all, um, but so many other countries do. And also a, a part of decolonizing health is having peer educators within our community. Um, there are so many different mental health crises within our black, queer, and trans community. And of course, we don't really feel safe calling the police uh, for uh, when these crises happen um, because the police harm our people. Um, they're not safe for us. So having peer educators within our community who can be a first line of response when there are folks going through mental health issues is super important. This is um, a promotion for a series, a decolonizing health series put on by a collective I'm a part of called Queer the Land um, and also Liberation Medicine, Medicine School um, that happened this past summer in Seattle. It was a space for black LGBTQ folks just to come together and be and talk about our health and our well-being uh, from carrying our ancestry and our bodies displacement from blackness, and also just the importance of rest, black, queer, and trans folks being able to rest. And some shout outs to some organizations who are doing work around decolonizing health. The Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, which is a national organization. The National Queer and Trans Therapist of Color Network, uh, which is a resource where you can find someone in your area who is a queer 
and or trans therapists of color and Rest for Resistance, which is an online mental health magazine for queer and trans people of color. Next, I wanna talk about transformative justice and community accountability. Um, firstly, I wanna say that people have been doing this type of work um, for centuries. Communities have been responding to harm and violence within their communities without uh, engaging the police and the state for many, many years, but it hasn't been documented like it should. Um, uh, the actual term transformative justice and community accountability came from black and brown, queer and trans activists um, who were doing work around creating community-based tools and strategies to deal with harm and violence within our communities without engaging the police or the state. Um, transformative justice and community accountability, uh, accountability um, values the survivor of harm being able to have a part in saying what justice looks like for them along with community members that they trust. And at the same time, transformative justice tries to transform the root causes of oppression, um, which lead to harm. Some of the different um, strategies that folks are working on, centering black, queer, and trans and non-binary survivors within the Me Too movement, um, finding new uh, creative alternative ways to deal with violence is on the forefront more than ever now because of the hashtag Me Too movement, but we need to remember to, to center the black, queer, and trans and non-binary survivors because we've been the ones leading anti-violence movement uh, for so many decades, um, if not centuries. Also community safety. So. Um, coming together and figuring out what systems, what networks can we put in place to keep our communities safe um, without police or state intervention. Um, and also ending interpersonal violence and in our social justice movements. Um, so there is an organization called Insight, um, Women of Color, Gender Nonconforming, and Trans People of Color Against Violence, who came out with a book called um, The Revolution Starts at Home. And the whole anthology is about how, how can we start to end uh, violence within our own social justice movements. It's so important to do that before we are ever going to end uh, violence that happens within our society. If we can't tackle it within our own movements, uh, we're not gonna be able to end violence at large. So this is um, a lovely picture from a collective I'm a part of. Um, I recently moved uh, back to Atlanta, but I was in Seattle before that for many years. Well, four years, not many years. Um, and I was a part of a collective called Queer the Land, and our goal is to collectively um, own our land and our labor. Um, we also had a program called Building Autonomy and Safety for Everybody, which is a community wellness and self-defense program. So we not only learn like physical skills um, to keep ourselves safe, but we had conversation or conversations around how to respond to violence within our communities without police or state engagement. And more shout outs. So Insight, who I already talked about, uh, that flyer um, on the, I, I don't know my left or my right, on the far side is from um, Audrey Lorge Project, Safe Outside the System. Um, so they, they work on you know, finding alternatives outside the system to deal with violence. Uh, also Just Practice, which is an organization that um, can come to you or you can go to one of their workshops and you'll learn how to apply transformative justice and community accountability within your own organizations and your own communities. Um, the last strategy I'm gonna talk about is um, anti-displacement organizing. Um, so black, queer, and trans folks, we're often displaced in so many ways. Not only are we um, displaced from the land that we originated from, but we also are displaced for economic reasons, because of gentrification. Um, there's so many different reasons um, that black, queer, and trans folks are being displaced. 
Um, and almost any major city in the country right now, there's gentrification and displacement happening. Um, and we all know that housing is a super big part of healing. If you don't have a safe place to live and a stable place to live, how can you heal, right? Um, and so some of the different strategies um, that I'm gonna talk about um, include community land trust and cooperative housing. So community land trust kind of, once again, they involve engaging with the state, which is uh, co colonial, right? Um, you have to uh, deal with nonprofits and uh, 501c3 statuses and all that other stuff, but it is a way to create affordable housing. In a community land trust, um, usually a nonprofit uh, purchases land and they keep that land forever and steward that land and houses or uh, condos or you know, apartments are built on top of that. Folks have 99 year leases. Um, and if you sell the house, you're only able to use a formula, formula that will keep the house affordable. So it keeps, essentially it keeps housing affordable forever if, it, if it's working right. And some other anti-displacement strategies that are happening, keeping oppressive institutions out of people of color neighborhoods. Um, I'll call attention to some struggles happening in Seattle. Um, there is a fight to keep a, a new youth jail from being built, a $210 million youth jail, um, and to be spent on actually doing restorative and transformative justice with uh, youth of color instead. Um, there is a campaign, Block the Bunker, to stop a police facility from being built. And there's also um, a campaign against um, a gentrifying dispensary called Uncle Ike's, which is in the Central District, which is Seattle's historically black neighborhood. Um, and Uncle Ike's is a gentrifying force. So there are um, queer and trans people of color um, who are fighting um, to keep these institutions out of our neighborhoods. Um, lastly, land justice movements. So movements really led by indigenous and black folks to reclaim and steward lands. We know that we are on indigenous land right now. Um, and so we truly don't own any of it, right? And so land justice is really asking and dialoguing with indigenous communities around how to steward the land. Um, and then also black folks who worked the land and really built on the land and created this economy that we have today. We were promised 40 acres and a mule that we never got, right? So there are black, queer, and trans folks who are working um, to get uh, land as reparations for the work our ancestors did. Um, once again, I, I'm using Queer the Land as an example. Um, so um, once again, our mission is collectively owning uh, our land and labor, and so we're trying to um, get a space that will allow us to have transitional housing for queer and trans people of organizers who are in between housing or jobs. It would provide a community center, co-working space, a community garden, and eventually be a self-sustaining space. And this is a, a promotion we put out um, to let people know that we're looking for a space for ourselves. Um, Seattle is seen as a very LGBTQ friendly place, but for black, queer, and trans folks, it's not as friendly, and there's not many spaces to go to outside of nightlife, which can be, uh, those can be really harmful spaces. And a shout out to organizations doing the work. Um, that picture is of folks at the 23rd Ave Community Building in Oakland. Um, their building went up for sale, and it's a mix of um, housing and organizations led by queer and trans people of color. Um, when their building went up for sale, um, they were able to raise $90,000 in a crowdfunding campaign, um, and then they partnered with a land trust to actually buy the building. Um, Quilombo is in Oakland, um, and they are in a, uh, they've called themselves Africa Town um, in their neighborhood and they're gardening and creating community space for black folks. And Cooperation Jackson is doing the work of building cooperatives um, in Jackson, Mississippi and just having a whole network of cooperatives, housing cooperatives, worker cooperatives um, for black folks in the South, which is um, 
where a lot of us black folks call home. Okay, so um, I would love to talk to folks about what kind of organizing are you doing to heal? What, what have you heard about? And I would love to keep in touch with you guys. Um, email, Twitter, and Instagram. Support me on my Patreon if you wish. And if you're interested in um, consulting, um, there's the website. Um, thanks so much for um, being here today. And I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you.